Welcome back. In this lesson, we're going to take a look at solving trig equations, something that you've actually done before, but we're going to do it again. And I'm going to show you a few tick, uh, tricks and tips on how to solve some of the more complex ones. And I'm also going to make sure that we're comfortable with finding all of the possible solutions on an interval. So usually people get the one that their calculator gives them, but get a little bit stuck after that. So let's take a look and see what these look like when we jump into them. I'm going to start off with couple really simple ones, hopefully fairly simple ones. So uh, 1a is just solve for tan theta equals 1, and we want to solve on the uh, interval of theta between 0 and 2 pi. We could be doing this in degrees too, but we need the radian practice anyway, so let's do this. Okay, the first one really is just a one-step problem. For those who don't recall, you can just solve this by doing tan to the negative 1 of both sides. On the left side, tan to the negative one of tan actually just undoes tan. They undo each other. Um, I often refer to uh, this inverse stuff as being untanning or uncosing or unsigning because that's pretty much what's actually happening. It's undoing whatever was done in the first place. So that one there, we just pick up our calculator and punch it in, making sure, of course, that we're in radians. So I just punch in one and on my calculator, it's second function. Yours might be shift or uh, inverse, tan. And I get out that theta equals 0 0.785. I think that's good down to uh, three significant digits. And most students, that's where they would stop. Actually, most teachers, that's where they would stop. Because they're forgetting that that's not the only possible solution. There is another one. I am going to go over to Desmos to show you that solution, but I do want to make sure that you understand that you don't need to go to Desmos if you think about what the actual graph of tan looks like. So just to speed things up, I've already gotten the, uh, the grid set up in here. So we'll just type in our function, uh, y equals tan theta. I'm going to type in tan x because it's just easier than typing in theta. And we want to solve where it's equal to 1. So what I'm going to do is put down y equals 1. And if you think about it, if y equals tan x and y equals 1, their intersection will be tan x equals 1. So I actually <laughs> I like using Desmos better than my calculator, to be quite honest with you, because uh, I'm more positive that it's correct. So here we get an answer of pi over 4. And uh, you can double check with your calculator, but pi divided by 4 is 0 0.785, which is the answer we got. This just happens to be the exact answer. Okay, so where is it also equal to that value of 1? And it looks like between 0 and 2 pi, it's also equal to 1 at 5 pi over 4. So that would be our other answer. And we can plug that into our calculator and say 5 times pi over 4. And I get 3.927. So just going back, our other answer, 3.927. And if you were asked to find exact answers, your exact answers would be pi over 4 and 5 pi over 4. Okay, that seems pretty reasonable, not too bad. Um, part B takes this one little step further. All we have to do in this one is say, okay, divide both sides by two, cos theta equals one half, theta equals cos to the negative one of one half. And I'm pretty sure one half, uh, I, I probably could have gotten this in the first one too, but on one half, uh, that is one of our special trig angles. So if I look up where cos of theta equals uh, 1 half, I see that that happens at 60 degrees or pi over 3. And by the way, uh, if it asks us to find this exactly, we'd have to find pi over 3. It's just asking us to solve each. You're welcome to solve for a decimal in that case. Let's go back to Desmos. I'll get rid of the tan and put in a cos. And we want to see where that's equal to 1 half. 
and we should see it right about there. And there's our pi over three answer. And again, if you visualize what coast looks like between zero and two pi, it's symmetric about the middle, which means if one answer is pi over three above zero, the other answer should be pi over three below two pi, just because of symmetry. You're working your way in from both sides. And without even clicking on that button, which I will in a second, 2 pi minus pi over 3 should be 5 pi over 3. And sure enough, it is. So that's how we have to start thinking about this. Um, there's some symmetry in the cos and the sine. There's a repeating pattern in the tan. Tan replace, uh, repeats itself every pi, which is why we got pi over 4 and 5 pi over 4, which is 1 and pi over 4. Uh, anyway, our answers here are pi over 3 and 5 pi over 3. So we can go back and fill that in as our other answer. Now we already have exact answers, so I don't see any point in going back and trying to find decimal versions, uh, especially since we didn't need to plug it into our calculator at any point. All right, what about if we have something like 2 sine squared theta equals 1? I think we can divide both sides by 2. Remember, sine squared theta really means the same thing as sine of theta all squared. So we can take the square root of both sides. And at this point, I can do the inverse sine of both sides and get theta equals. And uh, I usually don't even bother writing the sine to the negative 1 on both sides type thing. Uh, to me, that's a redundant step. You know you're unsigning both sides. And 1 over root 2, I believe that's a special angle as well. Sine of theta is 1 over root 2 at 45 degrees. Uh, sorry, 45 degrees, but since we're working in radians, that's pi over 4. Okay, without even going over to Desmos yet, I want you to just kind of visualize what pi looks like looks a little bit like this between 0 and pi. So if pi over 4 is one of the answers, the other answer should be pi minus pi over 4. Pi minus pi over 4 is 3 pi over 4. That's my prediction. I didn't even need to pull up Desmos to do that. I just know what sine looks like. So going back over to Desmos, just to verify that we are correct, we want sine of x equals 1 over, and I can never remember the hot key for square root, so I'll just click on that, the little keyboard arrow, 1 over root 2, and by the way, it tells me what that's 1 over root 2 is equal to there, but if I click on that, pi over 4, that's, that's what I knew, and the other one is, as predicted, 3 pi over 4. Now I want to point out that Going back here, I found the solution to this, theta equals pi over 4 and 3 pi over 4, without a calculator and without Desmos, just from prior knowledge. That doesn't mean I can't use the calculator or Desmos, it just means, in this case, I didn't even need it. And that's a pretty detailed answer. Okay, how about uh, the next one? 3 tan squared theta equals 1. Pretty similar trick to part C. Divide both sides by 3. Take the square root of both sides. And then do the inverse tan of both sides. And I think that one is one of the special ones as well. 1 over root 3 is the tangent of pi over 6. Now you can do that by remembering your similar triangles and recognizing those numbers, or you can do what I do, and I've got my little table beside me because I hate to try and memorize them all, or just in case I miss any, it's faster to look them up this way. Okay, and again, I'm just gonna quickly draw the graph here. The graph of tan looks like this. So that's two pi, this is three pi over uh, sorry, 3 pi over 2, this point there is pi, pi over 2, and 0. 
So if I do that equals one over root three, it's gonna happen twice. Once there, that's my pi over six answer. And it's gonna happen again here. And since the pattern for pi repeats itself every pi, sorry, the pattern for tan repeats itself every pi units, it should be pi over four and pi plus pi over four. And pi plus pi over four, uh, sorry, pi over six and pi plus pi over six, so that'll be seven pi over six. And we'll go back and verify this with Desmos real quick, just to make sure we're not crazy. Switch that back to tan. Change this to one over root three. One answer is pi over six. The next answer is seven pi over six. This stuff is beautiful. I actually really enjoy doing these. They're somehow satisfying. <laughs> anyway, uh, I have a sixth sense of what apparently I find fun. Let's do a couple more. Uh, secant theta equals four. As you all recall, secant is one of those secondary trig ratios, or reciprocal trig ratios, that I absolutely hate. So the first thing I'm going to do is say, uh, secant theta equals one over cos theta. Now what I'm gonna do is flip both sides. And by the way, the mathematical operation for that is actually an inverse. So I'm taking both sides to the exponent negative one. And this actually is cos theta to the exponent negative one, not to be confused with cos to the negative one theta. Now is one over four one of our special cos angles? And I don't think it is. So this one we're gonna actually have to pull up the calculator. So I'm just gonna point, push in one quarter, again, making sure I'm in radians. Second function, cos. And I'm getting out 1.318. And I don't think that this is going to be a particularly nice uh, value as far as multiples of pi go. It might be. Um, I'm always surprised which values of or multiples of pi I don't remember off the top of my head, but it's there. And now I'm going to just do a really quick little sketch to remind myself between 0 and 2 pi, cos looks like this. So if one of the answers is 1.318, The other answer is the same distance from 2 pi, and that must be 2 pi minus 1.318, whatever that's equal to. Go away. And literally, I just punch it into my calculator. 2 times pi minus 1.318. And I'm getting out that the other answer should be 4.965. So let's see if that actually works now that we don't have a nice multiple of pi or we don't have one of those special angles. Uh, I'm actually gonna do, yeah, let's do cos. I could go back to the original. We'll see how this that works in just a second, but cos of x equals one quarter. One of the answers is 1.318. And is the other answer 4.965? Oh, it is. Okay, so we've done it correctly. Now I do want to point out that I could have also solved this if I was just using Desmos, using uh, secant x <coughs> equaling four. And I'm going to zoom out just a little bit because it doesn't fit on the graph. But it does have those same two values between 0 and 2 pi. You can see it has more answers. It's just those answers are beyond uh, the, the region that we're looking at. And most string functions actually have an infinite number of answers if you don't restrict it to a region. And I like to restrict it to 0 to 2 pi or 0 to 360. That completes one, one full circle, and then we're good to go. Okay, going back to another equation, 
course I saved the best one for last. This one looks, jeez, go away. Um, if anyone knows how to stop those from coming, let me know. This one here looks really, really, really nasty, but I, I'm gonna just play a little trick. What if we pretend? What if we pretend? Pretend that cos theta equals x. x is just something, I don't know. There's no x in this particular problem. Well, if I pretend that cos theta equals x, then I can say that this is 3x squared minus 4x minus 5 equals 0. OK, that actually looks solvable. That's just a quadratic. Uh, is it factorable? I don't believe so. Maybe it is, and I'm just not seeing it. Um, but I have my quadratic formula, and I can just really quickly remind myself that's a, b, and c. And I will say that x is equal to uh, negative b. I'm going to say the letters, but plug in the numbers. Whoa, stop freaking out. Plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4a c all over 2a and just because i don't want to have to do a whole lot here inside the bracket uh, negative 4 squared is 16 negative 4 times 3 times negative 5 is positive 60 so that's going to be positive 76 over 6. okay and this is where we pull out the calculator 4 plus the root of 76 divided by 6 is 2.1196 or 1, 2. Technically 1, 2, 0 if I want to keep the three digits or three decimal places. And the other answer would be 4 minus root of 76 divided by 6 is negative 0.78. Six. Okay, so those are my two possible answers for x, but now I need to remind myself that this isn't really x that we're looking for, it's cos theta. Okay, so cos theta is equal to one of those numbers or the other. And I do want to remind you that cos theta looks like that. But it has a maximum and a minimum of plus one and minus one, which means this answer is no good. We don't need it. So now all we have to do is take a look at cos theta equals negative 0 0.786. And then do the inverse of both sides. Inverse, or sorry, inverse second function whichever you button you use on your calculator. And I get out the answer 2.476 is what it rounds to. Now that's one of the two answers. So that's uh, one possible value and it occurs over here somewhere. And then the other value is it going to be at 2 pi minus that, whatever that's equal to. So if this is theta, the other one's going to be 2 pi minus theta. And so I pull out my calculator and I put in 2 times pi minus 2.476 and I get out 3.807. Okay, so that was kind of a, a weird one, but really it was just solving a quadratic that was disguised as something else because there was no x, it was a, a cos theta, but same difference. So let's go over here and see if that actually works out. We have our, ooh, our big nasty equation here. So this was three 
Now, Desmos doesn't like the cos squared theta, so I do have to do cos squared theta that way, but it, it does mean the same thing. Minus four cos theta, and again, it doesn't like thetas either. Uh, minus five. Okay, so I, I'm gonna zoom out just so you can see the rest of this graph, but that's kind of funky. It still is a repeating pattern, it just repeats a little bit oddly. All right, and from there, we wanted to see where that was equal to zero. I don't know why I'm plugging this in, it's the x-intercepts, but one of the answers is 2.476. Well, that number looks familiar. And is the other number 3.807? Okay, 3.808, there was some rounding difference between our multiple rounding steps. Uh, we rounded off x and then we rounded off theta, so I'd say that's the same number. And I think we're, we're safe to move on and say that was correct. So now uh, this one, this one's, um, I would say it's a little bit trickier, but we could have also solved this one. We can actually leave these graphs on for a second. Once we did the hard work, we had y equals cos x, or y equals cos theta, I should say. And we wanted to see where that was equal to negative 0 0.786. And we'll see that this value and those, that value are the same, the 2.476. So whether we look at the original equation, which is basically the black and the red, or we look at the modified equation, the blue and the green, we do get the same answer either way. Okay, so now that we've played some tricks on how to solve these quadratic, or sorry, how to solve these uh, trig functions, trig equations, let's take a look at an actual word problem. The temperature in July can be modeled by the equation temperature at T, time T, capital T is for temperature, little t is for time, equals 8 cos pi over 12 T minus 15 plus 20. T is the temperature in Celsius. T is the time of day on a 24-hour clock. So for those who aren't overly familiar with a 24-hour clock, noon is noon is 12 o'clock. 1 o'clock p.m. becomes 13 o'clock. Um, 5 o'clock is 17. Midnight is 24, and so on. So the first part, uh, what would the maximum temperature be each day, and at what time would that occur? Now, not all of these are going to require big calculations. Sometimes it's just going to require thinking about it. So let's take a look at this. Um, this part here is really just cos of an angle. And cos bounces between 1 and negative 1. So the biggest this first term can be is 8, and the smallest it can be is negative 8. So 8 plus 20 is 28. So it would be 28 degrees Celsius. And when does that occur? Well, if you think about what cos looks like, and by the way, I draw these graphs all over the place when I'm trying to think about uh, trig functions and solve them. It's its largest value at the origin. Uh, oh, sorry, not the origin, the uh, y-axis. So basically, it's going to be when x is equal to 0, or in this case, little t is equal to 0. Or more specifically, uh, sorry, it won't be when little t is equal to 0. It's, it'll be when the thing inside the bracket is 0. So 8 cos 0 is 8 times 1. To make the inside of the bracket 0, the pi over 12 doesn't do anything. t minus 15 has to be 0, which means t equals 15. And 15 is 3 p.m. Okay, so at 3 p.m. it's 28 degrees Celsius out. What would the minimum temperature uh, be each day, and what time would it occur? Okay, so the minimum temperature is going to be the 20 minus the 8 degrees, which is 12 degrees Celsius. 
And without even doing a calculation, if this is going up and down and repeating every 24 hours, if it peaks at 3 p.m., it's going to have its minimum halfway through the next day, which is 3 a.m. Now, if that doesn't make a lot of sense, I do want to remind you that what we put inside the bracket for cos, so the pi over 12, t minus 15, in order for this to be at its minimum, cos is at a minimum when the angle that you plug into it is 180 degrees or pi. So now we can divide both sides by pi multiply both sides by 12 and we get t minus 15 equals 12 t equals 27 okay wait a second 27 is not what we said it would be we said it was going to be 3 a.m that would be 3 but if you think about a 24 hour clock 27 is 3 a.m the next day which makes sense if our highest temperature occurs over here at like 3 p or 3 yeah, p.m. Then the next day happens. Yeah, I think you get the idea. Since it repeats every 24 hours, this is the equivalent of 3. And that's where our 3 a.m. comes in. Okay, and now this is where we have an actual real-life application, and that's that Mr. Ray hates the heat and will die of heat stroke if it's more than 25 degrees outside. During what time should he avoid being outside? Okay, this is the kind of thing that I could solve in several ways, uh, but we should solve it algebraically, or at least try to, since that's kind of what this lesson's about. So, looking at the equation, t at t equals... T at T equals 8 cos pi over 12 T minus 15 plus 20. And what we want to do is set that equal to 25. So I'm just a bracket there. 25 equals 8 cos pi over 12 T minus 15 plus 20, and that looks really nasty, but solve it like you'd solve any other equation. Work through it one step at a time. I'll subtract 20 from both sides. I will multi or sorry, divide both sides by 8, and I could put 5 eighths, but yeah, I'll put it as a decimal number, is 0.625. And if you're kind of stuck on what to do here, just take the inverse cos of both sides. So the inverse cos of 0 0.625 is 0 0.896. And the inverse cos of cos, all that stuff, is just what's inside the bracket. Okay, so I'm going to add 15 to both sides. Uh, sorry, I'm going to multiply both sides by 12. Divide by pi. And I get 3.421 equals t minus 15. And I'm also going to uh, add 15 to both sides. When I do that, I get 18.42. Now, remember that time is on a 24-hour clock. So this is actually 6.42 p.m., if that makes any sense. Now, that's 6 p.m. and 42 hundredths of an hour. .42 
0.42 times 60 is 25 minutes. Okay, so when should I avoid being outside? At 6.25 p.m.? That sounds weird. Part of the problem is here we need an interval. And the interval is caused because there's more than one answer to our cos. The step that we need to relook at carefully is this one right here. I guess this was a step technically. But when we said take the, uh, the cos and get an angle, remember this only gives us one angle. There's actually another possible solution. So if 0 0.896 is one of the answers, the other answer, because of symmetry, is going to be 2 pi minus 0 0.896. Go away. 2 times pi minus 0 0.896. So I also would have gotten 5.387 equals cos pi over 12 t minus 15. Oh, sorry. Sorry, sorry, sorry. We'd already gotten rid of the cos at this point. Pi over 12 t minus 15. And now we just really quickly go and solve that the same way we solved the other side. Multiply it by 12, divide it by pi. 20.578. Add 15 to both sides. going to round that off to 35.58. And again, 35.58 is a weird number for time, but keep in mind that since we're on a 24-hour day, 35.58 hours is the same thing as that minus 24. So the answer really is that it's 11... Uh, 0.58 or uh, just after a little over half uh, past 11 so 11 30 something and the 35.58 is still 11 30 something but the next day so just to be really clear on this one uh, 58 one hundredths of 60 minutes is 34.8 which is about 35 minutes and that would be AM. So once we've got that far, the answer really is Mr. Ray should stay inside between. Now we, we know it's um, those are the two times. Just use a little bit of logic to realize what order they should be in. I don't think I should go inside at 6.25 p.m. at night and come back or stay inside until 11.35 the next morning. I should stay out during the afternoon. So I should stay out between 11.25 a.m. and 6.25 p.m. So those are the times that will kill me with heat stroke. And I'm going to go back into Desmos and we'll just verify that that actually works out. And if nothing else, it's kind of a cool graph. Get rid of those. Okay, so our equation that we had for our temperature, and I have to use an x instead of a t here, I believe, but it doesn't change any of the math. So 8 cos pi over 12 times x minus 15 plus 20. And we want to know where the temperature is going to be equal to 25. Okay, so now the one thing here is that my graph is up a little higher than I want it to be. But that's okay. 
I'm going to make a couple of changes here. Uh, just so that I can see everything clearly. I know my temperatures are fluctuating between 12 and 28. So I'm maybe going to go between 10 and 30. For my y-axis, that should mean that I can see all my temperatures. And sure enough, it does. Um, I'm going to step by 2 just so that it actually shows it on the graph. And the other thing I wanted was, uh, since I'm working in hours, it doesn't make sense to go up by pi over 2. I'm going to go from, actually just to show this, I'm going to go from um, negative 2, I guess, to 50. And I'm going to step by 5. Try stepping by two. Nah, it's, it's too crowded. I guess we'll have to work with five. Okay, so the times that I should stay inside are whenever the temperature goes up above 25. So up here. And that is the 11.58 that we found, or 11, and what was it, 11.25 a.m. And the other one that we found was 6.25 uh, p.m., which is, yeah, the 6.5. Uh, 421. Now just to be clear, uh, when we did do the math, I had mentioned that the answer we got wasn't originally 1150.58, it was 35, and that's just 11 a.m. the next day. Since our day repeats, starts there and then repeats at uh, x equals 24. So this is the beginning of the second day. So for midnight, it drops down a little bit, goes up, comes back down, midnight, the next day at 3 p.m., and so on. So when we're finding answers for something like times through the day, we may get numbers that don't seem like they make sense, and it's just because of the repeating pattern. It just means that we're getting the next day's value instead of the day we want. But we can add or subtract, in this case, 24 hours to the day and get exactly what we're looking for. Okay, we're going to stop there because that was plenty of, of equation solving for one day. Um, actually, I lied because you've got homework, so sorry. It's, it's all the equation solving i got to do today. <laughs> sorry. Um, I will point out that in the homework, it says to sketch by hand. Um, for one of the questions, four, I'd like you to try and do quick sketches by hand. So basically the kind of sketches that I was doing in the graph where it's like extremely approximate. Um, and then for question 22, just be aware that the textbook does have an error in the equation. The equation it gives is incorrect. Um, the correct equation is at the bottom of the, uh, the handout for today. So if you've got any questions, please let me know. Otherwise, good luck and we'll see you next time.